Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and I'm here today for the first time in a year, believe it or not, um, with Alex Ferretti, because not only is he one of the few go-to people that I actually use when I need information, uh, especially when it comes to keto and heart rate variability and anything kind of technical because um i'm just not into that sort of thing he's way better than me um <laughs> but it's been far too long since i spoke to him so alex welcome to the show again mate thank you thank you it's always an honor uh, uh chatting to you Paul. Uh, all- and interestingly enough you 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 tend to be the person i think of when i look at a certain type of specific training so uh okay. i may have a few questions for you good man yeah brilliant yeah that's, i'd love to be able to give back to you in some way that'd be awesome right so, you know what, we, um, the reason Alex on the show is because, obviously people know if you listen regularly that I've been doing a lot of ketogenic stuff recently and um, I'm always very interested in how do you optimize things and so on and so forth. But I um, do my research and there's lots of views about things recently and one of the things that are coming up is the fact that calories that we measure or that we see on a label or that people say you know is in a database could well be very different to what the actual numbers are that are being stated especially if people are fat adapted and lo and behold i look at trying to do some research into it and whose name comes up but mr (laughs) ferretti right so listen mate tell us what has been going on and what have you been finding and how did you even start looking at that kind of thing sure um i'll start I'll start from why I started to look into that. Now, I, in my, okay, we were taught about caloric value of foods, of different foods. And we know, you know, four kilocalories, four kilocalories, nine kilocalories, that are carbohydrates and fats. And, um, I always notice that in people that are metabolically healthy or they have a certain degree of health, the plus minus of a certain amount isn't that important. Meaning, you know, if someone one day goes below 200 and below 100 the following day and up 300 the one after that doesn't seem to create a major problem. So meaning the body can adapt reasonably well to these kind of energetic intake and as you may have noticed recently rather than speaking in relation to calories I'm mentioning energetic intakes now the prompt for that was I was I was a bit battered from different trainings and I tend to recover doing uh, bike rides so it just helps the flow, stimulation. So if I'm bruised and, you know, from training and my muscle are sore, I tend to relax and recover cycling. It just recover. I recover faster and better. And, and so, sorry, Alex, does that, does that matter if you're outdoor cycling or do you, can you do it on a stationary? I, um, I haven't noticed any major difference. Yes. Also because if I go for a two-hour ride, do two-hour ride, do two-hour turbo session indoor I would rather shoot myself yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd rather get out in the rain in the wind and, and, and whatever rather than stay inside yeah. um, but I would probably assume and this is an assumption that a gentle ride so basically I watch my my stuff on uh, here I have in front of me a, a, a massive TV I plug in the computer put my turbo trainer here and you know just watch sport like you know judo karate yeah. you know something like that and even in an hour definitely my hrv the following day is slightly higher compared to the days that i don't so maybe yes does it do the same i don't know because the length of my turbo session cycling is normally a lot lower yeah. <laughs> than what i can withstand looking at the sceneries around you know where I live. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the but the so, basis behind it is to get the blood flow correct, consistent through, correct, and then help correct. the healing. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. that's that's the one to just keep the body, you know, recovering and activated. You yeah. also have. I, I I always try to in a recovery ride. 
I always try to be sub cortisol secretions. So uh, it's 130 beats per minute ride at 27 kilometers per hour for a couple of hours, possibly fasted. Well, most of, virtually all the time is fasted, um, just to you know stimulate that metabolism recovery and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I went for this ride. And um, I look at the data on, 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 on my phone from my heart monitor and the speed and etc. And I noticed it was 1,280 calories for a simple 130 beats per minute ride. The maximum was 146, but at the very last, the, someone decided to drop a hill right in front of me. <clears throat> As I resisted to do any heels yeah. until the last bit, and I was doing so well. <laughs> and then I, I thought, oh, you know, F it, I'll do it. Um, Could have always got off and walked, you know that. The, the, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, I know my body a little, and there is no way I have consumed that amount of calories in this ride where they are comparable to a hard karate session. And I thought, there is no way. So I then contacted, I was put in contact with, a, um, with a, an engineer, engineer kind of analyst. I don't actually know, but I just know the guy macerates science like no one else I know virtually. And the beauty of it is that he does not have any formal nutritional training. So he's a He's a complete out from any low carbohydrate, hard carbohydrate, anything that we may have been exposed by in a biased way from any teaching. So, so dude, uh, his name is Waker Jarras. He's an amazing guy, and I'm really lucky to, to, to work with him. And I said to him, right, okay, so these two things, in my view, don't match up. Yeah. And then he started to read Search idea I mentioned all the areas in relation to calories measured in a calorimeter and what happens in our physiology. And this is when the discrepancies started to appear and be more so more, more evident, yeah. really. So the, the first thing that we have noticed is that obviously calories in labels there is a substantial difference. So you take two foods with exactly the same amount of food mass per gram and exactly the same ingredients, depending upon what database the, the people in the food labeling, or the company that's labeled the food has used, you can have a difference between 17 to 25%. That's a lot. Yeah. So I understand the 5 10% more plus minus is okay, but if you go plus minus 25%, that's 50% difference that you can get within the labeling. Yeah, so yeah. that was the first hiccup that we found. Now, as far as I'm aware, there are mainly four sites that, uh, there are five, but four of these sites, they, they, they kind of process the, the caloric and hold the caloric database, they're all in Finland. Uh, so depending upon the kit that someone uses, which algorithm, which sensor, which uh, hardware they actually use with the implementation of the software, then the caloric value can have a substantial difference. So that was the first point that we thought, okay, so maybe these are not as precise as we think. You give us a guidance, mm -hmm. brilliant, yet maybe we need to be a bit more aware so that you can easily see why sometimes I smile when I look at a label in, in a food and it is, I don't know, 253. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> you know, I'd be happy if you get the tens, not yeah. the units. <laughs> yeah. And is there, a, is there any metadata to show all of those four labs and what their average is throughout those foods? Okay, that beautiful question. That brings me to my second point. So <clears throat> to answer simply to a question, yes, there is. Uh, or there would be, uh, Waco seems to have found a couple where there is like a massive database that that equals to that. Yet, if we look at the definition of a calorie, the calorie is the amount of heat 
and I'm stressing the word heat, generated by a certain substance that is burned in a calorimeter, not in a body, yeah. that is needed to raise a one degree centigrade a certain mass of water. Okay, so depending if it's a small calorie or, or a large calorie, then fine. But what originally the calorie was trying to ascertain, the, the, they made an assumption the certain amount of heat released in a calorimeter would equal to a certain amount of energy produced by the body. Yeah. And if you are on a glycolytic diet, this correlation is reasonably good. I'm not sure if I can say good, but it, it's, it's reasonable. Okay, so th there is some degree of precision. Now, if you take someone that is fat adapted, and I'm not saying just ketogenic, I mean fat adapted, meaning that their body preferentially uses most of the times beta oxidation and ketone metabolism to produce energy. This is when the substrate have different value for heat and ATP produced. So we know that the mitochondria, um, in, within mitochondria, we have so substrate enter the mitochondria, and mitochondria produce heat, produce ATP, uh, and then produce a bunch of free radical. Okay, so the they, they byproduct of it. If they burn a certain substrate, they release a certain amount of heat versus ATP. And this is how the original calorie, that was the assumption that was actually made by scientists in actually using that formula, that correlation. So you can say, well, instead of trying to measure all of these in bodies, we can actually do that in a calorimeter and estimate how much ATP is actually generated. That is all fine to give us a guidance. Yet, when some fat adapted, due to the nature of the substrate, meaning fat and to a certain extent ketones, um, per amount of heat generated, they produce more ATP. And the body function on a, functions on ATP, not. We need heat, we definitely need heat, but it really is ATP that we're looking for. So if we compare, for example, 18 carbon molecule fat that is going through beta oxidation and the equivalent 18 carbon in glucose, which is three molecule because glucose is a six carbon chain. So we need three of them to make up 18 and compare apple for apples. Yeah. In that case, the best ATP produced net from carbohydrate metabolism, 18 carbons, is at best 96 molecules of ATP. With fat, depending upon which fat, is plus 120, generally. There are certain fats that are processed differently. So you can actually see that the, 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 the load of ATP from fats is, is much higher. And the, in the ratio, ATP versus heat is, mu is, is much more valuable coming from fat rather than glucose. The, obviously, glucose is more versatile because it can be used in instances when there is low oxygen and carbohydrate and fats cannot do that. So that's the reason why if someone needs that glycolytic pathway when doing certain amount of uh, intensity. Okay, so that, so th they both have advantages and disadvantages, yet the caloric value that we have estimated for now with the data that we have is around 20% overestimating if you are fat adapted. Mm. So. 2,000 kilocalories, let's assume someone needs to maintain it, on a ketogenic diet, fully fat adapted, or a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, fully fat adapted, probably they need between three and 400 value caloric less yeah. on today's to do the same to, to, for maintenance, basically. Well, um, if you're getting, more, you're getting more energy or more ATP yeah. from a single molecule, then your body doesn't yeah. need to burn as much because yeah. there'll be a cap on the amount of energy that it will require. It will use energy as much as there's a demand. 
So Correct. Unless Correct. you're unless you're doing an extra five hundred calories a day in exercise to try and burn yeah. the, the 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 excess energy, then it's just not going to use it, right? That, that, that that's that's our point. That's our point. Now we seem we have assumed, and I'm very careful in saying this. We have assumed that the correlation is still linear, so is the percentage. So what I'm trying to say is, okay, if you're measuring things for you to have an idea where you're at with your metabolism and what is your energetic intake, keep calculating with the current uh, formulas or devices, but be aware, perhaps, that if you're fully fat and active in a healthy individual, so where the... Uh, cellular entropy, uh, so uh, when the mitochondria are functioning well, let's say, then be aware there could be a 20% surplus. Yeah, interesting. Now, in ketones, that's a slightly different, uh, slightly different uh, scenario because the body can spend quite a bit of energy in making ketones as well. So maybe that could balance out. Right. So the problem is more, I think, is more evident for fatty acid going through beta oxidation rather than using ketones. Yeah. I, we haven't found any major comparative data from what it takes the body to get glucose into energy and ketones into energy. We only know from glucose from ketones, but obviously... They require some steps yeah. in, in order to get there. Now we're just trying to actually um, show you something here that if you ask me another question, I in the meantime I'll try to get. Okay, so have you? Because um, I know you're um, on keto gains and on the, uh, the Facebook page and so on. Have you yeah. compared their um, macro calculator? Um, to your potential uh, information and seeing where it where it comes, because that uses the Kappa Cardal, yeah. the old um, method, and then they put in some interesting um, uh, calorie burn formulas. So yeah. I'm wondering whether or not, because there are a lot of people on there that are saying you know they lose lots of weight. Yeah. And there are others that will say, oh, you know, oh, I've got this weight plateau and I'm, I'm eating more fat, but it's not burning off. And they've, they've got a, a basic misunderstanding of why and what. But then there are other people that are saying, look, I'm following it. Here are my numbers. Why am I not losing weight? So potentially that yeah. could do it. Um, uh, that's a great question. And uh, I, I've been tinkering with that for the last year and a half. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been very interesting with my... <laughs> Um, so, first of all, metabolic efficiency. That's the first thing I look at. So, that's the reason why I specified earlier, in people that are metabolically healthy, meaning the body, the mitochondria are working well. I'm sure you are aware of the keto flow kind of thing when someone moves into keto and they start to, uh, they need more energy than normal. That's because in the switch of fuels there could be an excess of substrate. The body, let's say this is not the medical term, but the body is confused on things to use. There could be an excess of substrate at the entrance in, in order to be used for energy. Mitochondria need to make that switch and and also the ETC, the electron transport chain, so the final part of the energy production. And there is something that we refer as uncoupling. So instead of producing a certain amount of heat and a certain amount of power, it produces more heat and less power. People can normally know that because they are hotter, they go hot and cold, hot and cold, and this is part of the normal keto flu adaptation. Hence, earlier, I mentioned is not just people in ketosis, but people that are fully fat adapted. So eventually, that cellular entropy, entropy means confusion, interestingly enough, and enthalpy, which is this is when things would regularize, 
uh, and it become more stable. For some people, it's for weeks. For some people, it's 12 weeks. But most of the time, a full fat adaptation phase in my, with my demographics of patients and clients has been between three to nine months. So this is the time that is required, generally speaking, for the body to become fully fat adapted where fat is used preferentially whenever it's possible as the primary form of substrate. Brilliant. Okay, so, now, sorry, so I've got a yeah. very brief question. Yeah. So I have had this discussion with many people and they turn around and say, yeah, you just need a few weeks and or, or a week or two and yeah. you'll be fat adapted and so on and so forth. And then they use this cyclical or targeted ketogenic diet where they are very low carb for the five days in the week. And then at the, on the Saturday, they have their refeed and they are under the impression that because of that, they will go back into uh, being using fat for fuel on the next day and going out of ketosis with that large bolus of carbohydrate on the Saturday will not affect them because they're fat adapted. My my personal experience of that is absolute nonsense. It, you just need like literally months and months of really keeping yeah. yourself on a good fat diet so that your body does, because there's trillions of cells all with mitochondria and then they, they need to catch up you know because yeah. your mind is saying i'm not eating this anymore <clears throat> they need to be able to know what is going on and adapt to it and there are people that are saying you know it only takes a few weeks i honestly think it takes like you say nine months maybe more and only yeah. then and correct me if i am wrong but i think only then is it worth looking at a cyclical or targeted ketogenic diet and using carbohydrate from that strategy because otherwise you're just not going to go back into it quickly enough to start yeah. burning. You're, you're never going to be preferentially burning fat right um i, I hear you very well good man um uh, in a nutshell uh in most cases we have seen yes this is our thinking as well i'm not saying that there are individuals that don't do well with that type of cyclical carbohydrates that you just mentioned yeah. however Interestingly enough, Dr. Jacob Wilson, um, um, he is in Tampa. He was also one of the lecturers at Low Carb USA. Um, and, and hopefully we can merge brain as well because he apparently really enjoyed my lecture on HIV and ketosis. And it's something that so far they haven't looked into too yeah. much depth. So, and he presented some of the research exactly on cyclical carbohydrates. And he's, he's actually carrying on and he compared people that were in full ketosis, these were weight lifters, okay? So the nightmare for a ketogenic diet to a certain extent. And people that were constantly in ketosis and perform similarly, yet the symptoms and self-reported symptoms in the cyclical carbohydrate group were way worse. To the point that when he showed the graph, of the actual beta hydroxybutyrate in blood in relation to the ketones, when they were well, refeeding and cycling the carbohydrates at the weekend, because obviously they can be more relaxed, it coincides with the social, this assuming that they had a good quality refeed, not, not yeah. well, I, I hate the word cheat days, I yeah, detest yeah. it, because that, that puts a whole kind of guilt connotation to it, and people think that they can eat rubbish. That's not the point. So uh, cyclical carbohydrate refeed has to be done cleverly and timely. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the key that in certain sports we have found, in certain type of high-intensity physical performance that is normally short-lived, uh, can be beneficial. But that has to be thought through. It's not that, oh, by the way, you know, I'm doing this and Saturday and Sunday I go out and I can eat, you know, pizza, chips and everything that I normally don't. However, comparing like for like with the same rough quality of the diet but different proportion of substrates, so having more carbohydrates in the carbohydrate refeeding group, these people would kind of start to re-enter ketosis midweek next week. Yeah. And they were keep they were kept, they they kept going on and off that fat adaptation. So to me, is not ideal 
because one of the greatest things about low carbohydrate, high fat diet, and ketogenic diets in performance is that your symptoms are nice and stable. So you, you, you hardly have any. Your glucose is great. Your energy supply is great. You can exercise faster to stimulate mitogenesis and all the other things that people are looking for. Would I want to do that system in a competition when you have constantly high intermittent burst of effort in anaerobic? No. This is when we can timely use carbohydrate supplementation either just pre, during training, that specific session in order to maximize the glycolytic pathway for when we need it. Yeah, but and also That's, what people, oh, sorry Alex, what people aren't realizing, yeah. you know, I'm assuming you're, ta you're talking quite small amounts of, of carbohydrate, whereas yeah. when people are refeeding on a Saturday, they're having hundreds of grams. No, no. And, and, to, and to benefit realistically over an hour, from a glycolytically demanding sport like yours, uh, BJJ, MMA, karate, that kind of thing, where you are we are going full at it, it's kind of just yeah. 15 grams, really. 15, 20 grams, maybe? Yeah, sometimes I breeze the 30, depending upon what we are doing specifically. Yeah. But if... if <clears throat> so, to train, I try to train my body many times in the worst possible case scenario. Okay, mm -hmm. so I make as tough as I possibly can. So some of the sessions are totally fasted when I completely deplete and then use the time to refeed my glycogen stores. We know from various studies, um, uh, you know, having a good chat with one of my colleagues, called, uh, Dr. Justin Roberts, about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the faster uh, study implementation and the studies where we know the glycogen doesn't go any lower or the replenishment is as fast as. So we can replenish glycogen in that manner. Yet, if I have a session where I can, when it doesn't really matter what results I'm going to get, I try to do it faster and really try to maximize that GLAT4 sensitization, which normally in a ketogenic diet, we tend to potentially lose. Mm. Okay, so it seems that when we are on certain type of fat adaptation using that fuel all the time and a steady, constant, steady pace, which fat adapted individual would be preferentially uh, at this kind of sport using this method uh, for better result, then or better endurance, let's call it, then you don't want this, the first hill that they find or the first sprint, they are okay. The second one, not so good. And the third one, it is nothing there. So it, it was really interesting, the conversation, because I keep training that. I keep training that sensitization of GLUT4 by trying to ask my body to use that. And this is when the carbohydrate supplementation, I think, becomes pivotal because... If the effort is constant, so when we do full, maximum speed, maximum power, uh, then we have the sparring session. These are five, six sessions consecutive with 30 seconds rest in between. It, it's pretty tough. If you know, mm. you know, I think you have experience in boxing or something. So mm. the, 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 you know it's pretty damn tough. Yeah. So eventually your arm says, uh, how many times do my arm weigh? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Whose is leg do those, right? And then, so this is when you cleverly refeed carbs. This is pre and during training. By using carbohydrate constantly during training and you refeed away from the training, we have found more troubles than what is worth. Mm. And it will take people, it doesn't take the person out of fat adaptation but then he's going to start to mess around with blood values. Yes. And that can be, for some individuals, that will express in symptoms, will express in craving, will express in dizziness, will express in perceived low energy. Yeah. And if they start training and if someone pushes them to run, then they are actually fine. But for them to get into that mode is actually quite hard. There definitely will be less willpower to yeah. push yourself you definitely give up quicker 
because yeah. you feel as though well, there's just nothing there today. So um, you know, I might as well just not bother. Precisely. Uh, yeah, I know Precisely. exactly. Yeah. Maybe. Precisely. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Jacob is doing some 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 work in his team. He's doing some 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 great work. So I think the problem is more is more. Uh, do I actually need to sensitization of blood uh, ported to for my body to use glucose? If the answer is no, then maybe that carbohydrate timing isn't actually that relevant. And it's, I was watching the Olympics, the cycling. Mm. Guys, some of the cycling, you think you are carrying an extra stone to two stones extra in weight, and that's not muscle. It's that, that, that's quite interesting because... Are you talking about the cyclists that are holding it through their, their glycogen stores that they're carrying? No, no, no. I'm talking about central adiposity. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That that was scary. And I think, okay, I can recognize a muscle or yeah, yeah. a fat. One one doesn't really wobble. The other one does. Yeah. It you know even for a profane can 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 look at someone and think right. Okay, that's muscle. That's a mix. That's not. Mm. So I'm pretty sure that the you know their ability to cycle, their ability to sprint. Is great, and you can actually see the difference between sprinters and 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 and, and people that do more of a long type of effort. Yeah, yeah. We know, for example, that at the Tour de France, none of these healthily overweight cyclists they are just not there. But you can actually see that the people they do certain um, type of approach on a low carbohydrate, high fat. Added to the France actually performed quite well, allowing the, the rumors that these people are on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet is actually true. Obviously, mm. I, I know the people that work with these teams. Um, to me, they seem very reputable people. Um, I met them. Uh, definitely, they know what they're talking about. Um, they've done a lot of experimentation through three, four, five years when I wasn't even fully aware of these type of diets, and you know the results are there. So, you know, when you see emails from an athlete, you think, right, okay, you know, th this is actually true adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So, yet these are people that during the race they still use carbohydrate, and when someone is fat adapted very well but at the time of need or just pre-time of need they use carbohydrate this carbohydrate become rocket fuel mm. because there is the sparing the kind of ability from the body to to spare these for that sets of heels for that specific sprint for whatever it, whenever is the the, the 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 maximum in an ass is actually needed yeah. The people that try to, they're fixed in trying to say that fat adapted people still perform well in an anaerobic state. We got science to prove that otherwise. Yeah. With, just with, without, without the extra carbohydrate in that moment, it's going to be a difficult thing. But if you're not fat adapted, you're not going to be sparing that glucose because you're not going to be burning the fat anyway so you're going to end up taking it all up getting tired feeling dizzy all that kind of thing so it's you know it, but what my my original point is it takes so much longer than people realize especially yeah. if you are a little bit less sensitive with carbohydrates so for example for my dna test i'm not great with carbohydrate on the best of days yeah so we're the same so we need to work quite hard at keeping that long-term fat adaptation going and we can yeah. easily drop out of it whereas our other people will be on the other end of the spectrum that almost just easily yeah. just use both yeah yeah, and, yeah absolutely and, and none of us like those sort of people because they make us very <laughs> sick <laughs> okay mate. yeah absolutely so so if someone wants to try and use this information practically yeah are they gonna st do they have to start worrying about the, uh, the the numbers on the on the on the food labels and knowing you know what they're using for their for their calorie take or 
is there, and I've got an opinion on this, is there a better way? Because this really comes down to either you're trying to lose weight or yeah. you're trying to perform in a certain way. And the majority of the yeah. market is trying to lose weight or lose body fat. Yeah. So this is, I'll put my two pence in and then you can tell me what you think. But yeah, go for it. Good man. At the end of the day, if a client is measuring their calorie intake on the same uh, piece of software, so let's say my fitness pal. Yeah. And they're using the same food on each one. So they say, it says chicken breast cooked, uh, I don't know, 100 gram, and it gives a number to it. Yeah. So long as they're using that same reference every time, at the end of the week, they can measure whether or not their weight and measurements have gone up or yeah. down. If it's decreased, then they know if they want to put weight on, they need to go up on those numbers. If they need to lose weight, they need to go down on those numbers. Yeah. The, the actual reality of how much protein, carbohydrate, and fat, fiber, and sugar are, are in those numbers is almost irrelevant because it's how your body appears at the end of that period. You know, yeah. You've had that metabolic change, the adaptation, the fat burn, whatever it is, on those numbers. So if those numbers said it was 20,000 calories a day and you'd lost weight, then that's the reference you would use. Yeah. But is it going to be... Because there are so many labels on so many foods. Yeah. If people are using a barcode scanner, yeah, you know, it, like you say, you have two tins of tuna with very, very different numbers on it. How, yeah. What, are, what is the best way for, for people to avoid that problem? Okay, for for a matter of simplicity, um, I think that a method to, to, to like what you mentioned is great. Yeah. Okay. So, and also still staying with the same simplicity type of approach, the beauty is that if you measure everything in calorie and you're always using the same thing, very likely the error would always be in a certain way. Yeah. Okay, so you just when you start to mix and match thing that, you know, you sum some of the labels and you sum up and you actually see this in my fitness pal, by the way. So take, uh, if you search for something that is 100 grams or you keep the same value and they come out with a list of foods you will see that their list always matches up. But if you import, so if you scan a barcode of a certain food of a certain brand, this is when things start to break down. Mm. So you have, hang on, a, hang on a minute, it's still 100 grams of that single value, that single food, yet one is giving me 90 kilocalories and the other one is giving 110. Yeah. So that you, you can actually, people can ascertain that by themselves, which is added to my questioning. So the other way, if they use the same kit and they, are, and they know they're fully fat adapted, and I'm talking once again, not to reach ketosis, not when the blood shows some blood values of blood ketones, not so when the breath is constantly high yellow into the red. Mm. and they're constantly operating in that level. So the body so, has so, used so, up so, acetoacetate. So when you say that, uh, yellow into the red, you're talking about a breath ketone meter. That's reading. correct. Yeah, yeah, the ketonics. Yeah. yeah. That seems to be more of a reflection of what has been dismantled from acetoacetate and used up and exhaled yeah. due to, generally speaking, associated to what has been used. Yeah, that's okay? the, that's the so, end end of metabolite that's the end result of it to show what's been used very much like yeah. hormones at the moment if you do the dutch test they're looking at urine metabolites of you that's been used rather than what's free flowing in the blood so yeah. you can see what's yeah. been absorbed yeah absolutely i'm actually doing some testing with them um and uh you know they very kindly provided some uh, uh some tests uh for me to experiment via ketosis uh, not ketosis uh, me in normal condition, me at rest, me during high stress response, me during high physical stress response, and me in exhaustion. I'm not looking forward to the exhaustion, but I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, for the sake of science, I really love to actually see what happens to cortisol, cortisone, all the melatonin and everything else. It's, it's a, they've been great, actually, because yeah. uh, they don't get anything out of it. And they, they've just been really, really good, uh, especially one of my colleagues called Dr. Carrie Jones uh, did quite a few 
you know, to view podcasts. We lecture together um, a couple of times. So back to your question, in a nutshell, if they use a caloric value and they maintain the same food, then they cross-reference that with what their body weight actually, how the body is actually behaving. As long as they can understand the difference between losing mass, lean mass, and losing mass as in adipositive, so fat mass. So normally the loss of fat mass is pretty evident. Um, but if they want to take even a caliper to go yeah. to a local gym or even buy one, they, they can get some kind of estimation. That's the reason why right now Waco is in the process of, of, of um, trying to put a mass label per grams of food rather than a caloric value. So if you kind of know what you're doing, you know that your carbs should be between 20 and 30 or 50 or 60, whatever someone has, whatever is the tolerance level, they have a reasonable set amount of protein and the rest is fat. Mm. If they need to lose weight, the way how we operate at present, so let's assume, let's get a round figure of me 2,000 calories, right? Fat adapted, I maintain around 1,600, okay? That's my sweet spot for maintenance. I went below that and I started to show the sub vein. So instead of the, instead of the main veins, I'm starting to show, so you can see in the shoulder, you can see in the chest, and this was three weeks, two weeks ago. Uh, it, like I was preparing for a contest, mm. uh, and it, I, I, I wasn't. I just wanted to see that limit. So at that level, so they reduce that, then I know how much calories I would get from protein. I, for me, a good ideal uh, protein requirement is around uh, 1.8 in general training, 2.2 per lean mass as far as breakdown. So if I do some power training, uh, so I switch it. I know 30 grams to 40 grams of carbs is my tolerance. The rest, to go to that figure of 16, 17, 100 calories, will be fat. Yeah. But then when if you bring they it, want to... <clears throat> sorry, Alex, when you bring it down, what, what sort of number are you bringing it down to? Kind of 1,500 or something? Yeah, yeah, it becomes reasonably sensitive. So even a couple of hundred kilocalories, these are, these, these, they, they, you will see some 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 results yeah um I, I never like to lose weight too quickly um sometimes the body kicks in with defense mechanism and start to be more holding or glucose goes a little bit haywire so, so that's quite low right i mean 1500 calories a day for an active male is is quite low are you are you then Say I don't know. Say, say you're doing 400 calories a day of exercise. Are you then adding that back in? Yeah, precisely. Right. Okay, precisely. Yeah. But bear in mind that if I do the right, I would add the value that my monitor would say minus 20 percent again. Yeah. Because I'm using fats, not carbs. Whereas if you, when I go in high, intermittent, constant, protracted intensity of training like we do with forms and sparring and yeah. you know contest and etc then i add the same value because i will be using carbohydrate for them yeah yeah Thank so you. this is an estimate but we are working it out as we speak uh hopefully it should be ready next week or the week after the next yeah. we don't know um then we can have a better and in our view a more precise measuring for fat adapted people but also carbohydrate we 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 for now with the data that we have we assume that for for, for people on a glycolytic diet and they are glycolytic where preferentially they use glucose the difference between calorie and what we would find in mass will be okay, okay. whereas if we operate with fat adapted individuals this is when the weight will be substantially different from the mass because it's using beta oxidation rather than any form of gly glycolytic yeah. pathways to get there. Okay, and then also I've noticed in the past some labels are just wrong. And, and that's it. You can't even dis discuss it because 
I remember <laughs> once, a, a, and I will brand it, a Tesco own brand quinoa in 100 grams showed 22 grams of carbohydrate or something. Yeah. And, and it's miles out. It's three times that, what it should be. Yeah. And um, but people will take these things on board, and they'll say, "Okay, if my carbohydrate is sixty grams for the day, then I can have three hundred grams of that." And realistically, yeah. they're taking in one hundred and twenty grams a day. Yeah, so a lot of that has got to be looked at as well. I mean, realistically, I don't know if it's even practical, but we need some form of kind of policing method that says this yeah. is what it is. And well, precisely. So, but let me ask you a question. Um, so, think about if you go by the percentages of ketogenic, the usual standard percentages for ketogenic diet. Yep. Okay? So, you know, 75 to 80 percent of fat, 15, around 15 percent of protein to try to make it equal to one. 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 grams of, of protein per, per uh, mass, per ideal weight mass, yep. and then the rest is carbs, 5 to 10%. Have you ever noticed that it doesn't match up with your actual requirements? Yes. That's, that, I, that, that was the third trigger that said to me, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the kind of rose the question, there is something not right in here because mm. I know my body requires that amount of protein. If that is 15% and that is 5% for the carbs, I'm either going hypercaloric with the fats or the protein, so it doesn't match. No, because you'll end up, especially with, with your 1,500 calories, you'll end up with kind of 60 grams of, of protein a day or something like that whereas you know it should be kind of 120 maybe something around those numbers um, precisely precisely but if then a person in a glycolytic diet goes on 1500 they, this they, 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 it won't happen <laughs> it won't it won't be a very pleasant ride yeah. <laughs> that's for sure yeah yeah so uh, or you know if they need to turn up but and the, the other this is a kind of there is a bit of another myth that I'm sure you are way well aware of it. We, because you're eating fat, you can eat as much fat as you want. Yeah. Not quite. For the first well, two, you, three, four weeks. You, you know, you can do, but don't expect to lose weight while you're doing it because there's yeah. nine calories a gram in there. You're going to be massively it, overeating. Also, don't expect, don't ex let's assume they all get the fats that instead of nine grams, they're actually contributing seven grams. So yeah. they, they get away with it. Okay, better. It's still twice as much. Yet, the ATP produced by the grammage of this is still much higher than glucose. Yeah. And when the body perceives that overabundance of substrate, it will inevitably shut down. Because I see weight in excess in the body as a dietary fat that has been stored. So when people work out a, a, a plan for growing, maintenance, losing excess of losing excess of fat mass or increasing both fat mass and lean mass, they have to take into account in the losing bit that they need to subtract some of the calories that they need per day from their stores. Yeah. So when I see people just dumping dollops of butter in coffees and then keep eating that and drinking that and, 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 and all the foods that they normally have and they go hyper-energetic, although we may call it hyper-caloric, and they keep saying, you know, I can eat as much fat as I want because it's fat, therefore I lose fat. Um, yeah, I saw some of very comprehensive cardiovascular profile blood tests and they went that pretty. No. No, so the, the uh, you know, LDLP particle, the HDLP particle, total triglycerides, you, you can really start to see that the body just has an excess of these. Mm. And yeah, same thing applies to, to, to many other cases. But it's like so many things that... 
you know, if I'm going to try and sell a book or a program or a, an online system or anything else, I need to be able to have a an attractive hook. So if I say yeah. you've got to eat less than 30 grams of carbohydrate a day for seven days and then on the on the night of the seventh day you can eat pizza and chips and ice cream and cake and so long as you go straight back on the next day and you'll be fine and it will it will have all of these uh, yeah benefits it will have all this hormone improvement and have yeah. fat burning improvement this that and the other and i put that into a book and i call it carb night and i show you that this is how i look and this is all i do yeah. And it is all marketing and pretty yeah. much not really realistic. Like, you know, if I say that you can you can do that stuff, then you'll buy it. So right during the week you just eat burgers and uh, and asparagus, and on the weekend you eat that, and and you're good to go. It, it, if I'm just trying to turn around and say, listen, if you eat too much, you're going to get fat. People can go, yeah, I know that, but tell me something more interesting. And go, well, there isn't there isn't anything. I can't dress yeah, it up. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, the people say, oh, calories don't matter. And some people, calories are calorie. Well, in depending upon which scenario, they're, they're both right. Because if you keep increasing the mass, so when the body is metabolically healthy, it can actually change how, what the output is naturally. Yeah. So the body will rev up the biochemical processes that, with the extra mass, it can produce heat, it can produce, it can repair tissue, it can do all sorts of stuff. But if it goes way over, this is when we're going to start to see problems. And one of the problems, especially in people that are not that metabolically healthy, is a completely disastrous cardiovascular profile. Yeah. And this, especially male over a certain age, because they think that by having a certain type of drink and MCT oils that they can eat as much fat as they want in any other form. This is that I, I've seen, I've seen a few too many of these, yeah. uh, you know, that they came to me with certain books and actually say, Oh, you know, but this is what he says. Yeah. yeah. Clearly <laughs> let's assume what he says is right. You know, for, I'm not saying that it is, but I'm saying let's assume that he's right. You're still consuming way above <laughs> constantly and repetitively and on top of that you have one day every seven or after six where you just pile it on mm. that should be a, a relaxed increased carbohydrate day should not be a cheat day yeah, yeah. that is i think our problem is to be honest Alex, the issue i have with clients that i see and i'm sure you are as well is I can't remember the last time I saw someone who was metabolically healthy. <laughs> they all come in with an issue of some description that, that that's why they're trying to fix it. Very yeah. few people come to you that are healthy unless it's an athlete who in themselves have their problems. But yeah. Unless it's someone that's coming for, for sports performance or trying to improve a certain thing of it, the majority of them come to you and say, this is my problem. I want to fix it. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, um, I tend to now not really see patients and clients any longer. Uh, I tend to work with a few people, a few uh, people that refer to me for a very specific reason, mainly athletic performance. Yeah. That's the reason why I was very careful in actually saying, you know, people that already have a certain degree of metabolic health and... I have seen the implementation of ketogenic diet and low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet into daily lives uh, in the past. And when people adopted that, then in, when they adopted that in a bad manner, then things didn't wrong. go very well. Yeah, yeah. Anything done wrong is destructive. Yeah. And also, I mean, some people are just not suitable, full stop. There are certain people that didn't matter what they, what they, what, what they, what they do – they just don't function well. Yeah. And this is after a period of adaptation. Is it, They just don't function well. And tra interestingly enough, they can process carbohydrate very well. So many times I use the DNA fit test as a prompt. Okay, yeah. so if someone, if someone has an elevated glucose level and is carbohydrate sensitive, it, it maybe look 
you know, low carbohydrate, high fat diet is the best possible diet. I don't think that DNA fit can suggest that because the research on this is just starting to appear now. Yeah. And also they work by genetic association. Okay, so they won't be able to say ketogenic diet, but definitely they can say low carbohydrate diet. So you only have other two substrates. Yeah, you know, one is processed, that is fat. That's it. They, they, they recommend low carbohydrate or Mediterranean yeah. and yeah. Or, or lactose free or whatever it is, d- d- yeah. depending on that. But at the same time, I think uh, a DNA test like that to an end user with no consultation with a practitioner yeah. is not being interpreted properly. So, so if, if I get one yeah. done for a client and I'll turn and say, listen, from my perspective, I will advise, they won't, but I will advise yeah. that we we use this approach. It could be on an intermittent fasting on a low yeah. carbohydrate yeah. to try and improve your yeah. function and, and carbohydrate sensitivity. And that's going to be better off for you, certainly in the short term to get things back on track. And then we can look at changing things, but they're, they're not yeah. going to do that because they can't, right? Yeah, well, yeah, it's a very risky yeah. position to be in, uh, especially if research is not quite there yet. But all I can say for now, what the space because uh, I want to uh, collect lots of people with DNA fit results. They are keto and non keto, and with similar results, she see actually the differences. So this is going to be my next project. Um, so then maybe if they want, um, I can perhaps contribute in designing, you know, a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, but not just low carbohydrate, maybe just also high fat, yeah. medium protein. I mean, you know, it depends on what is their goals. Most people that do DNA fit is for performance, weight loss or curiosity. Yeah. That seems, in my opinion, I'm not saying that this is what DNA fit says uh i can't speak for them uh but definitely my demographic these are you know how to optimize their performance if someone has a a rubbish lifestyle then why would you want to do dna fit (laughs) first of all sort out your the 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 first most primary basic things you have yeah so um but that you know that's something that i'll be working with hopefully with you know some of my colleagues like you know, Craig Pinkering and, uh, you know, just if he's going to help me in collecting this data. Uh, some of the people on Facebook that have already done it, they can send it to me <clears throat> or can just let me know I have the FTO, ADBR3, ADBR2, and then, okay, which diet are you on? How are you performing? Which diet, where are you on? How are you performing? Yeah. And eventually and hopefully someone can fund a, a, an interventional study rather than an observational study and that would be great yeah absolutely. that would be really great okay so listen this is an hour now and and we haven't even scratched Whoa. the surface so okay we um so people who want to find you more about your work because you've got a, a really busy um lecturing <laughs> schedule as well around you know you, you you're getting a global now with yeah. your talks, right? And they're getting left, right, and center. Plus, I saw yesterday, I think, or the day before, this year's um, uh, CAM conference stuff that you're doing. Um, uh, no, by, uh, who is it? Biocam. Biocam, okay. sorry. Yeah. Um, huge amounts going on. So if people yeah. want to find out about more about you, your work, or try and contact you, where's the best place? Um, really simple. I, um, it, whenever it's possible, I keep my dating my website. It's my full name, alessandroferretti.co.uk. People can relax in there because I don't sell anything. I don't sell tests. I don't sell vitamins. I don't sell supplements. They just need. Eventually, um, I'm going to go in preparing courses uh, for people that really want to optimize. My view is that we still cost peanuts. Uh, I just want to maintain this education. So but most of the stuff will be, most of the basic stuff will be free. So people can, you know, they can disagree with it. It's totally fine. But this is what we observe. We, 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 we don't believe in one thing or another. We observe. If we are wrong, it's because we have observed wrong. Yeah. <laughs> or we don't know, you know, of other things that, you know, can. So alessandroferretti.co.uk. Um, yeah, I'm not taking on 
uh, for obvious reasons, patience right now because I would provide an awful service. Um, I just sometimes make some exception for some elite athlete or, or someone that is, you know, really, really poorly that has been referred to me working in a team or something. Um, but that, they, they can just keep up to date. My Facebook page, I keep posting stuff all the time. Um, and if I make a new video or there is a new blog, then I will then, uh, you know, go and post it on Facebook so then I can go on my website and listen to the whole thing. And there's some interesting things on YouTube that you've posted over the last kind of three or four months when it comes to ketones, measuring them, how, why, oh, when, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So it's worth worth checking out. Talk, talking to Justin Roberts, which you did earlier, I spoke to him recently, and um, we're trying to get a time for me, you, and him, and maybe one other, two others maybe, to sit in a room and try and make a, 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 a plan to, to find out how we can use some of this information or what tests we need to research we need to do to kind of improve things because um, but the, there's some very, very good ideas coming from each camp and it's putting yeah. them together I think would be really, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I had a... Um, um, I, uh, I had a, some kind of collaboration in a couple of PhD studies that, that I presented. I think they're entering stage two in yeah. the study. Um, um, and I had it just before I, I, I went to the US and, you know, I always have so much respect for Justin. He's, he's, he's just great. And um, it's really interesting to see his approach and my approach. So it was kind of, oh, shall we meet for a coffee? And I didn't leave until 11 in the evening. Mm. Yeah. So that was the afternoon. We just kept bouncing ideas and oh, this may be this and this may be that. And, and you know, it, these were the whole conversations and it, it was really, it's really great. And I feel very honored that he even asked my opinions in relation to these studies. <laughs> yeah, no, he's a good guy. And anyone that can run across the Sahara um, is clearly insane. So good for him. Nice. Yeah. Um, right, mate, listen, thank you so much for today. Um, we will keep in touch definitely because there's so much more we can talk about. And if you, uh, Ever want to come on and talk about exercise or you've got <laughs> questions, then let me know. <laughs> All right. That's great, my man. And it's always my pleasure. Anytime you want, good man. Brilliant. All right. We'll speak soon. Catch Thanks, you later. Alex. Cheers, man. Ciao. Bye. Bye.